think they have land that runs from where the Northern Pacific Railroad begins in near Lake Superior as it comes right out to our area, right toward Burbank. And so George W. Cass here knows that he has an important job in creating new towns along the way. And so he's going to do that. He is uh, the, he, he, they get out here to the Burbank area, right to where they're building the, uh, the steam boats. And they are going to uh, build a bridge over the Red River, the first bridge built over the Red River. And that bridge then would be, uh, would be the link from Minnesota going all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. There are two individuals who are important men on the railroad. They are directors of the railroad, and they had both been in business. This man here was in the primarily the, the railroad business. In fact, his brother owned that railroad, a man named Jay Cook was his bro brother-in-law. And this man named William is uh, one, of the, uh, one of the directors of the railroad, as is this man right here. He had been in business uh, with, a, with a partner named Henry Wells, he, uh, which, which delivered things, an express company. He and Wells had also created banks and he was the former mayor of Buffalo, New York. They were both, these, both of these men were named William. This man's name was William Moorhead, and this man's name was William Fargo. And so Fargo and Moorhead are named for the first time when the Northern Pacific Railroad construct its first bridge over the Red River. And so that bridge in 1872 comes over this bridge and now the new little towns of uh, Moorhead, Minnesota, and Fargo, Dakota Territory begin. People start to move in here. And then the railroad runs into a little trouble. So, George W. Cass here, and that is who we would have our county named for, Cass County, he, uh, he talks to his land manager, a man who is not well enough known in this region in history, but he should be. His name is James Power, and James Power is the land agent for the, the railroad. And James Power is told by uh, uh, told by by Cass the railroad is running out of money here, and uh, we don't want to go bankrupt. So you have to find a way how, how we can recover from potential bankruptcy. And so James Power here, James Power, he looks out at this land which at the time, even the scientists at the time thought this Red River Valley uh, was like the great North American desert. People knew about the, about the uh, bison. They knew about the Red River ox carts. They knew about the steamboats. But nobody had ever considered anything over on this side of the river and in this valley that would be any use for agriculture. And somehow power saw something and knew something because he found out that that giant glacial lake that had created all of our rivers here, what they called Lake Agassiz, after Swiss scientist Louis Agassiz and his, his uh, theory of glaciers, he found out that in that valley that had been created where that giant glacial lake had been sitting here for 1,500 years, and on the bottom of it was all sorts of wonderful silt and clay, and good uh, seeping into the soil, making it uh, some of the most fertile, if not the most fertile land in the world. So he came up with an idea. He said to Cass, he said, I want you to go out uh, a little west here of the new Fargo, 
and, and plant, uh, plant wheat, hard red spring wheat. It is planted in the spring. It is hard, the, the bran on it, the actual bran on the, the wheat, as some of you know, is very hard to crack. But it has a high gluten content, which makes it an elastic uh, flour, and it's a, it makes a wonderful flour for specialty breads and other breads. But that wheat, that wheat bran right there, that shell was so hard that the rollers in mills couldn't smash it up completely. And then they had, the ones down in Minneapolis, down there, had discovered a new roller that could crush that shell so it would become nice, just a nice, very, very fine, you know, piece of, of wheat that would provide excellent bread, uh, you know, for people. And so now the Minneapolis Mill is, is called the Minneapolis Miracle, discovering that hard red spring wheat, which is ideal uh, for the climate that we have here, could be planted here. So, Cass says that he will, uh, he will try an experiment by James Power. Power says, I want you to, to go out there about uh, you know, 20 miles from, uh, from Fargo, and uh, I want you to, to uh, sell some of your stock in the railroad and plant wheat. But I want it to be a lot of wheat. Now, the average size farm in those days was about, was little less than 160 acres. And so Cass went out and he traded stock that he had in the railroad for all this land out there. And there, he would hire a farm manager from just south of St. Paul a man known in Minnesota circles as the Wheat King, and his name was Oliver Dalrymple. And Oliver Dalrymple had the largest wheat farm in the United States at that point. So he comes up and he works with, for Cass at the Cass farm and his partner's farm and gets his own farm, and he plants nothing but wheat. And soon it becomes a giant operation. In 1877, he has 500 men and women working on one farm. 1877, that's a huge amount of people. And they, they have this new wheat, these giant wheat farms, thanks to Power's suggestion. And so these wheat farms are making so much money and it's like sudden wealth for people that they came up and named, gave them a name, meaning big. Uh, wonderful riches and abundance of good things. They thought of the Spanish word bonanza. It would be a bonanza. And thus began the era of the bonanza farm. 91 bonanza farms up and down the Red River Valley. Oliver Dalrymple's great grandson is still working on some of his grandpa's great grandpa's farm. And his grandson is John Jack Dalrymple, the governor, the present governor of North Dakota. So, uh, and they, and he goes out to this little town where Cass owns the town, and they name that town after Mr. Cass and call it Castleton. And so, now, um, in, in 1890, when we have become the state of North Dakota, we get our land grant institution, the NDAC. They hire their first, uh, they hire their, their first um, uh, president of the United States, came from, uh, came from out east, had, 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 uh, had experience overseas, and uh, his name was Horace Stockbridge. That's we have Stockbridge Hall on campus named after the first president of NDAC. But he runs afoul of the State Board of Higher Education three years later, and they fire him. And so then we end up having an interim president, and we're only three years old, and the interim president turns out to be Mr. J.B. Power. 
and, and, and so he becomes a you know, non-academic interim president. But then all through that time, Lincoln's work, the Morrill Act, uh, uh, you know, takes place. NDAC gets larger. They have uh, they have all sorts of agriculture. Their first five professors are all in in, the, in agriculture or science, and then it just grows and grows and grows. It grows so much. This grand experiment in in people college for people everybody that they get start to get sports teams, and they so they get a wonderful sports team uh, that they name the Farmers. And so it's the NDAC farmers, and they go up, and then, then it changes. They say, well, let's get another one. Then they, they change it to the NDAC Aggies. They're still the Texas A&M Aggies. They play teams like University of North Dakota uh, Flicker Tails, which was a little gopher uh, up there at UND. And it may end up being one of their nicknames, who knows, in the next couple of years. Um, so... Uh, we become the NDAC uh, farmers and then Aggies. And then a little bit later, as the story goes, around 1919, the, the, both the students on campus and the, uh, the, the sports administration said, you know, Aggies is, is, is fine, we love our farmers, but it's just not tough enough. So they say, we have to have, you know, something that is more tough and more historical, so they go with the bison, the NDSU bison. Uh, and I say they could have gone with Tatanka, but uh, <laughs> they, they went with. So all of this leads to, and I'm, I'm running out of breath and space here, but all of this leads to, you know, the big picture of history always being drawn by, by people who are innovative and, and looking for that. And all of this has everything to do with an appreciation for Earth Day. Is NDAC and NDSU, and when we celebrated part of our, our anniversaries. This, this, uh, this was all called for the land and its people. And for the land and its people. We are the land and its people all the time. And that's how we have to take care of this precious land. The land has always given to us. Land doesn't need people. <laughs> the people need the land. The land can get the land and the water gets along fine without us. But it's what we do and what we will continue to do in the future. And it's because of this land that we have all of this. And my time was up one minute ago. Thank you for listening. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thanks.